In today's video, we talk about the reverse diet. Hey guys, what's going on? This is Paul Ravello from ProPhysique.com and uh, you'll notice that I'm wearing a hoodie today. Well, it was about 38 degrees when I left the house today at 6.30 a.m. And why did I leave the house? Well, I am doing a reverse diet study here at the University of South Florida. The Exercise Science Department, which is headed up by Dr. Bill Campbell and has turned out such amazing people as uh, Lauren Conlon um, and, and many others. But Lauren is my business partner, so shout out to Lauren and also my podcast mate. I've had a lot of people ask me why, why I don't do a podcast lately and I actually do a podcast. So if you're interested in listening to me ramble some more as well as Lauren, well, check out Redefine Healthy Radio. I think we've got it on multiple platforms so you should be able to hear it anywhere. I'll try to put a link below. But the study that I'm a part of is actually about me. So I get to talk about myself. Yay. Um, we actually tested my specifics a week before my show. So I competed on October 27th. If you haven't seen that, I did a video on that. Uh, the OCB Yorton Cup, the World Championships of Natural Bodybuilding. I did the Men's Physique Pro Division. Now, one week before that, I went into USF and did some testing. So I'm gonna talk about what we did then, what we did today, which is exactly five weeks later, and then what we're gonna do in one month from now, all right? So we're doing three separate meetings and going over the reverse diet. Now, we had two options to select from with James's study, the reverse diet or the recovery diet. I chose the reverse diet. You'll ask, why did I choose the reverse diet? Is the recovery diet bad? No, the recovery diet is not bad. In fact, the recovery diet is a form of reverse dieting. I am doing a more conservative approach. That is the approach that I typically use. Uh, I have not used the recovery diet since I first started competing and all I knew about being done with the show was that I wanted to eat a lot of food. So I unintentionally recovered more. The recovery diet, without giving you exact specifics, is to intentionally put on body fat a little bit more rapidly post-show with the idea of getting you back into a good place, like hormonally, physically, and all those things. Whereas what I did was a little different. So why did I choose the reverse diet? Well. Knowing what I know now about bodybuilding, I don't cut loose after my shows. I prefer to stay a little bit leaner. I also do something prior to getting on stage that is a little bit different than what I did in the past, meaning my prep does not end when the show is over, okay? My prep goes on beyond that. I also raise calories and reduce cardio, essentially reverse dieting, going into my show. So I was eating so much food and my cardio was so low towards the end of my prep, I didn't feel the need to put on a bunch of body fat. So what I try to do with my athletes as a coach is have them ready weeks earlier for the show. Then we can experiment with raising calories and pulling cardio back and having them feel great going into the show. This does a few things, but one of the, one of the things it does is it reduces that feeling of like, you have to just cut loose after the show. Like you've been so restricted that you have to go crazy. And so that's why I reverse dieted because I don't feel the need. I don't feel it. I, I wanted to stay leaner. Most of my clients prefer to stay leaner. Um, and so that's why I'm not doing the, the recovery diet. However, if there is some data that shows that one is better than the other, well, maybe I'll make some considerations. But for now, let's talk about what the study was done on me. What were the specifics of the study? Now, here's the study. I went in for testing on multiple different machines. So the first one was called an in-body scanner. Stepped on this, what this gave us was my body weight, my in-body water, and lean body mass, okay? So you step on this, you hold some nodes, and you stand there still for a second, and it does all this testing, and it gives you some numbers. I did that, then we get off that machine, we go into another room, and James has an ultrasound machine, which actually measures the thickness of your body fat. That's right. All right, guys, we are here at USF. Brian and James are taking measurements. So they just did an ultrasound uh, body fat test, which is pretty cool because they actually used an ultrasound to measure. They don't use a caliper. So it measures the thickness. Can we see the picture that you get? Um, not on this one. This one just shows a graph. Much like a caliper would do. So you'll pinch the skin and you'll get a measurement of say five millimeters, six millimeters, right? And we'll use that as a way to calculate body fat. That calculation is based on math 
using that skin fold. Well, they're getting rid of the skin fold. They're not measuring the skin. They're actually doing an ultrasound through the skin measuring just the thickness of the fat. A little bit more accurate, I would say. So that's how the body fat testing was done in the old video that I did with Katie Rutherford um, and the video that I did with Lane Norton a while back. So let's talk a little bit about what that skin fold measurement did. It gives us a specific number of body fat that we can actually track as it goes up and down throughout the process. So my weight, the first time I came in was 198 pounds. My weight today was 206 pounds, so roughly eight pounds. Of that eight pounds, it said that I've gained four pounds of lean body mass. Gains! Some of that's gonna be due to glycogen, um, and some of that is going to be due to probably a little bit of hypertrophy. I do feel a little bit stronger. I'm sure I put on a little bit of muscle in that process, but I'm not thinking that it's a bunch of new muscle, right? I'm 43, I've been training for 25 years. I realize that this is probably just mostly fluid shifts and fluctuations. Now, the reason we do the testing first thing in the morning is because we wanna get an accurate, an accurate assessment of my resting metabolic rate. So before I ate anything, drank anything, did any exercise, uh, the next thing we did was I laid down on a table and I have video here to show you kind of what it was done. So what we are going to do here is we are going to test Paul's resting metabolic rate. Um, this is measured by indirect calorimetry. And what it's measuring is the amount of oxygen and CO2 that Paul is breathing. Uh, the CO2 will go into a chamber and the chamber will analyze the, the mixture of gases in that chamber and then calculate a, um, how many calories Paul is burning within a 24 hour period. It's only a 20 minute test, so it'll take the average of those 20 minutes and calculate that into a 24 hour calorie expenditure. And, at we, rest. and we have to do it in a fasted state kind of at yeah. rest. Yeah, we, want, we instruct subjects to come in in a fasted state and no exercise prior because we do know that exercise um, prior to this test can influence your metabolic rate. Um, it could probably increase it. And then the same thing with food. If you have a meal prior um, to coming in to have this test, it, it could also influence because the metabolic Because of the thermic rate. effect of food. So yes, body exactly. Okay. So it could increase your, your metabolic rate. And, this and again, is this, is, this is just the, um, uh, how many calories you're burning at rest doing nothing else. Uh, thank you to Brian, the lab assistant, who was helping us today. Uh, lay down, they put a hood over me, they block off all the air so that all the gas exchange that's going in and out of my body is measured and they can actually do an accurate assessment of my resting metabolic rate or basal metabolic rate. Basal metabolic rate basically being if you just laid there and breathed all day, how many calories would you burn? And so I think the first time I went in, it was around 1800 calories was my basal metabolic rate and then today it was over 2000 so I think but not 2100 so just just over 2000 now I'm not going to give you the exact numbers until I have all three data sets so then I'll give you the exact numbers but I just want to give you some ideas so I gained roughly eight pounds and I gained I went from seven and a half percent body fat the first time I tested to 10 today so two and a half percent body fat and I gained about 200 calories on my resting metabolic rate so you see all these things are ticking up. Now, we also did a strength test where we did a leg extension to failure using a percent of my body weight as the testing. And the first time I came in, I got 30 reps. And then we do three successive sets. And again, I'll give you all the data numbers when we're done. I'm just trying to recall them. I don't have all the paper and information with me yet, but I'll have all that. So my, my strength was roughly the same. I think I got one more rep this time on each set. And that might have been just through sheer will of wanting to beat myself. But so what is all this about? This is all about the idea that reverse dieting is new. There's no literature on it. This is all new stuff. It first came about a few years ago when we started having competitors come out of shows. And I believe the first person that ever actually documented and talked about it was Dr. Joe Klimzeski. He talked about metabolic building. Later, Lane Norton, who was my first coach, brought it up and talked about reverse dieting as a better way of approaching the off season. Instead of going into full bulk mode where you just eat as much food as you want, lift a lot heavier and say, hey, it's a perfect time to put on muscle post show, that's an excuse for just overeating. Well, it's not a perfect time to put on muscle post show. In fact, it's not a perfect time for anything but putting on body fat post show. So a reverse diet is a much more planned way of approaching a competition end date. There may also be some application for general population people who have been through lots and lots of diets. We see there is a correlation between the amount of times that somebody tries the diet and the amount of overweight they are. 
right? So what's happening there is you're suppressing metabolic rate, increasing body fat, and the two are way off balance. Well, if we can bring your metabolic rate back up, we can bring your body fat back down. So there may be some long-term benefits to understanding reverse dieting and just how it helps. Also, what I think we'll find is that these nutrition calculators that are online are mostly bullshit. That's right. If you plug in your height, weight, age, um, you know, other predictors of what your calories should be and plug them in, it's going to give you a calorie number. When I do mine, it's really high. So if my, let's say my basal metabolic rate is 2000 calories, right? And I go to the gym and I move around all day and maybe I play some guitar over there and I, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm at 3000 calories a day maintenance, right? Well, what if that thing tells me I'm at 4,500 a day and I'm eating 1500 calories per day more? What's that going to do? Well, it's going to put some body fat on me, right? So maybe we'll get some information that will allow us to make better predictions of our actual metabolic rate, right? Because I don't use those calculators. I use a diet recall with my clients. So that's it. Just wanted to give you guys some information on what the study was about, what's going on, what we're going to find out in the future and why we're doing it all in the name of being a better coach of science. And Hey, maybe we'll learn something along the way. All right, guys, I hope you're having an awesome day and I'll talk to you tomorrow. I'm not so